You're listening to the Talking Headways Podcast Network. This is Talking Headways, a weekly podcast about sustainable transportation and urban design. I'm Jeff Wood. This week, we're joined by Linda Samuels, Associate Professor of Urban Design at Washington University in St. Louis, to talk about her book, Infrastructural Optimism. We chat about how growth for growth's sake is not the answer and why systems should be more connected. Stay with us. Today's podcast is brought to you by our super generous Patreon supporters. Thanks so much for supporting the show. We really appreciate it. To join this merry band of infrastructure nerds and zoning wizards, go to patreon.com slash the overhead wire. $2 a month gets you stickers and a handwritten note. $10 a month gets you one of our bus only scarves. The fall is almost here, so get one to warm your transit loving heart today. Go to patreon.com slash the overhead wire. Today's podcast is also brought to you by the projects of the overhead wire, including our 15 year old daily cities newsletter, read around the world. We pull the best news about cities from around the web and share them with readers each morning. It's the best newsletter in the business, so try us out for free by going to theoverheadwire.com. You'll also find links to buy the scarf as well as our audiobook version of Raymond Unwin's 1909 classic Town Planning in Practice. Go to theoverheadwire.com to find out more. Linda Samuels, welcome to the Talking Headways podcast. Thank you so much for inviting me. Well, thanks for coming on the show. Before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. I am an associate professor of urban design at Washington University in St. Louis, and I teach in the Master of Urban Design program and the Doctor of Sustainable Urbanism program primarily. I started out as an architect. I have an undergraduate degree, Bachelor of Design. I have a Master's of Architecture. I'm a licensed architect. But when I decided to go back to school for a PhD, I got a PhD in urban planning. So within the design disciplines, I'm a little bit cross-disciplinary. But I've always been looking at sort of questions of the built environment. Why? Why did you verge away from architecture towards the urban planning sphere? I'm I'm a planner by trade too, so (laughs) I appreciate that. Well, as an architect, I was always interested in things on the fringe. So even though I studied buildings and had the capacity to put buildings together and to think about buildings, conceptualize architecture and was teaching architecture, I found that I was particularly interested in questions of social justice And at the time, those just were not in any way central to the architectural conversations I was having. And I was more and more interested in things at a scale larger than the individual object. So a building might influence its immediate site and its block. But when you start to think about streets and systems and cities, you're really having a much larger influence on society and the environment. So I thought I was going to maybe go back and get a PhD in architecture, but my concepts and my topics were not all that interesting to people in the architectural PhD programs. And the more I talked to people in planning, the more I realized that was the place where these things were happening. So luckily I found UCLA where I ended up having sort of one foot in architecture and one foot in urban planning. And both of my advisors were cross-disciplinary in that regard. And I really got exposed to this kind of spatial justice language at UCLA. That's awesome. So let's go back even further. How did you get into cities and and architecture initially? Like, was there a formative part of your early years that said, hey, this is something that I'm super interested in, the built form cities, et cetera? It wasn't so much cities. I actually came in through infrastructure, which is probably uncommon. So I did my master's in architecture at Princeton University. And when I was thinking about my thesis, I said to myself, what is the largest built object in the state of New Jersey? And it was the New Jersey Turnpike. And I actually did my master's in architecture thesis on the New Jersey Turnpike as a built form. So kind of a learning from Las Vegas strategy where I did a series of diagrammatic analysis drawings. I photographed the section, actually exit 8A to 11 was my segment. I would drive up and down the freeway and photograph it and then analyze those sectional pieces in terms of their kind of spatial implications, almost like the analysis of the ducks in the decorated shed in learning from Las Vegas. Oh, that's really interesting. Did you take a look at what was underneath before it too? I mean, the parcels or anything along those lines? I've seen a lot of that lately where people are going back and looking at the parcels of freeways beforehand to see kind of where that uh, value disappeared to. It's been interesting to look at. At the time, no. So this was in the 90s and it was still kind of under the sort of object fetishization moments of architecture. And I really looked at it as a design object. 
So overhead planes, rhythm and repetition, shade and shadow, you know, very kind of straightforward spatial object oriented analysis, figure ground, you know, so that at that point was, you know, was not really guiding me into the things I would be interested later in terms of cities. You know, I think that might have happened when I, I invented this curriculum when I was teaching at UNC Charlotte called the mobile studio. And the mobile studio was what I called study on abroad. There were all of these different programs that were going, you know, to Florence and to Paris and to Berlin. And I thought there's so much to see in our own country. Let's actually get students on the road and look at like how the road has impacted cities in America. So I worked with a group of students and we designed and built our own mobile studio, which was a series of desks and flat files and model building stations. And it was solar powered and the back half was a pinhole camera. So we could kind of drive around and then shoot these giant images, process them in the dark room, and then actually display them in the box, which was the satellite, which was plexiglass. And we went from city to city to city. And we were really looking at the different conditions where infrastructure and urbanism were intersecting. So we collaborated with faculty from Charlotte, North Carolina to Los Angeles. And then on the way back, we showed the work at different venues. And I got to Los Angeles and I just thought this is, you know, one of the most amazing places I've ever been. It's got every challenging condition. It's got every type of spatial construction. It's got every type of people. It's got every type of geography. It's got this mix of climate and opportunity. And it was kind of at that point when Los Angeles, you know, Los Angeles had been kind of shunned as a model. And then as the LA School of Urbanism sort of rose, the question became, is LA every city? You know, is every city in America becoming like Los Angeles? And that that was really how I got interested in it. I sort of came at it from the other side. That's really interesting. My first, um, and you mentioned CNU and some other things in the book, my first CNU was actually 2005, which was in Los Angeles, and the polycentric city was the main focus. And so it's kind of a, an awakening, I guess, in that time period for thinking about Los Angeles in a different way. Yeah, absolutely. There's so much interesting thinking that came out of Los Angeles, and it, it really made UCLA sort of a natural destination for my PhD also. Well, so that brings me to the book, which you mentioned all this stuff in, Infrastructural Optimism and the WPA 2.0. Where did the idea and impetus for this book come from? So the book, Infrastructural Optimism, is an extension of some of the work that I started as a senior research associate at City Lab under Dana Cuff and Roger Sherman. And City Lab is, a, is kind of an urban think tank at UCLA. And that is where we initiated the WPA 2.0 competition. So I was a senior researcher with them working on developing the ideas in that competition. That's where part of the ideas from infrastructural optimism came from, that work. And also a little bit from my dissertation work, which was about how we might transform large scale infrastructural projects into next generation infrastructure. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, it brings me also to the word optimism itself, right? Because it's the title of the book. What, in your opinion, is optimism? So optimism is the ability to imagine a better future in its most simplified terms. And, you know, I didn't start out thinking about optimism. I, I would say it also came from this. Um, I wrote an article for Places Journal when I was at UCLA, and that article initiated this title and this idea of infrastructural optimism. And at that point, it emerged from a book called The Resilient City. Vale and Campanella were the editors. And there's an essay in there about the role that optimism plays in resilience, the way that this idea of imagining a better future can help us recover from disaster, and that we sort of need that idea of a better future to propel our energies to move past crisis. So one aspect of the book is how optimism propels us to a better future when we are faced with challenges. But as I began to explore it more fully, and as is written in the introduction, there's this idea of individual optimism and this sort of paired idea of collective optimism. And individual optimism is kind of how we generate our own sense of optimism about our own lives, you know, our, our next job or our families or our, our houses, our places where we live in the city. But collective optimism is really how we work together as a society to build a better future, to imagine a better future. And that idea of optimism really works more effectively at the scale that I'm talking about, the scale of infrastructure or the scale of the city. And so working on this book and thinking about 
not just the physical structures, but really the engagement of people in this process. Optimism is also one of those things we don't think about when we're thinking about the right to the city. And I think one of my revelations really was that everyone deserves to be optimistic about their future. Everyone deserves to be optimistic about what they think the city can and should do for them. So that kind of optimism also comes from a sense of agency. Do I have agency in deciding what my future will be like in the city that I live in? And that agency comes from you know, having a voice, being at the table, having power in decision-making, having confidence in the people who are making decisions for us and with us. So it filters through all the different ideas in the book and it, it is sort of put out there as the ultimate city. You know, Our ultimate public space is an infrastructure of optimism. Where do you think we are with optimism at the moment? Um, it fluctuates more radically than I, <laughs> I have to say I ever thought. Um, I sort of, I was joking the day I sort of hit send on the book. I ended up not only writing the book, but uh, designed it with a graphic designer and, you know, took many of the images and you know, taught many of the classes. And it was April 20th and I was sending in the whole PDF and I thought I have, I have worked through three presidential administrations on this book and it is snowing today in St. Louis the day I sent it in. It never snows in April. Our, our frost date is supposed to be April 1st and I had a breakthrough COVID case. I had been vaccinated and I had I had gotten COVID from somewhere who knows where. And I had just done all of this assessment on like optimistic thinking and was totally surprised that Google was giving me all this feedback that optimism was one of the most widely searched terms during the previous 12 months. And you were I was hearing it everywhere, you know, everywhere everyone was talking about, well, in the midst of this latest crisis, we have to have a sense of optimism. So there's a, a quote in the book when Mayor Garcetti was the mayor of Los Angeles was updating the people of LA every day on COVID numbers. He was talking about, you know, the optimistic future. So I think optimism is part of our conversation. You know, we're, we're constantly sort of developing questions around what is optimism and what makes us optimistic. Well, now we're in the midst of looking at the latest infrastructure package. And, you know, my optimism is ebbing and flowing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can understand that. And it's it's quite an interesting time. I mean, you know, we've we planned to discuss this book for quite a while, maybe over a month now. And it's interesting that the infrastructure bill actually passes the Friday before we talk about this. And what's interesting about that is that there's so much to, I guess, worry about in the infrastructure bill as to whether it's the right investments, whether they're doing the right policies, etc. But then there's some sort of an optimism from them actually coming together and doing something. And then there's another one coming up soon, which you know, who knows what's going to happen with that, which has, you know, a whole number of other things that are related to infrastructure, et cetera. So I'm curious what you thought this last week after this momentous bill for better or worse passed. Well, and I, of course, have been following it like you have and your other guests have and have been watching the circles of investment shrink and all of the diagrams. And as I was reading this morning, kind of recapping what we're left with, I think what I was most reminded of, kind of sadly, is that, you know, since the early 1980s, when the original sort of critique of our woefully underfunded infrastructure started, Pat Choate and Susan Walter put out their report to Congress, you know, that's uh, infrastructure in ruins, that we are, this bill today, this bill this week is really kind of focused on maintenance and repair. You know, it is a lot of money going to a lot of neglected maintenance and repair. And it's less of a vision. And I mean, it's very limited in terms of its visionary outlook right. for an innovative future. And in some ways, it's just saying we're now finally willing to do the job we've been deferring for five decades. So to me, that's a little sad. I was thinking about it in comparison to the Green New Deal. And of course, that's why there's some hesitancy for people who are fighting for something more like a Green New Deal to support this infrastructure bill. And the Green New Deal, you know, for the first time, really, I think in any infrastructure effort actually recognizes that relationship between environmental justice and sort of questions of equity and jobs and puts those two things together. So, 
yes, there was a, a positive vote. <laughs> yes, there is some indication of, you know, working across political aisles, but like road repair is such a basic issue. You know, fixing our failing bridges is a low bar. So I'm optimistic we're going to do better with the next one. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting because something stood out to me that I've been thinking about over the last few days and after reading the book, the problem we have isn't always money, but systems change and political will to get things done. Perhaps the most impactful parts of the bill won't be the money they give out, but rather some of the tiny policies they change potentially, especially with that BBB bill. I think that's something that might pop up in the future that people are like, oh, I didn't realize that there's a couple of things in the bill that I noticed the last couple of days when I've been trying to kind of go through it, then I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. The MUTCD, for example, there are, you know, the ability for counties and cities to use a different manual than maybe Ashto's guide, you know, that's allowed in this bill. So little tiny things like that, you know, you could probably use the NACTO guides if they're, you know, allowed by the Federal Transit Administration or, or even FHWA, et cetera. So it's interesting to look at it from that perspective. It might not be the money, but maybe it's the policies. Absolutely. And I think the Build Back Better is going to be different, I hope, from the sort of infrastructure investment bill that we just passed. And I agree with you completely. And I, I will also say the other optimistic thing about this is that we are having conversations that we never would have had 10 years ago. You know, we are absolutely talking about transit in ways we weren't talking about it 10 years ago. We're talking about cycling infrastructure. We're talking about social infrastructure. We're talking about things we wouldn't have been talking about 10 years ago. And that's amazing. You know, that's fantastic. So I think you're right. They're also, they're not hidden, but there's also a lot in the minutia that could shift the needle. And that's what it's going to take. This is not a quick thing. Yeah. Well, so let's go back a little bit. You looked at urbanism in the 80s and 90s, pointing at the new urbanist movement and, and others. What can we learn from that time period specifically? So I do, and I sort of look at them as a response to what I call the sort of pessimistic urbanism or the you know part of the postmodern urbanism era that came before that. I think where we are right now is, you know, we're still on that lineage. You know, we are still trying to figure out how to respond to sprawl. We are still trying to figure out how to respond to the challenges of climate change. And what we see happening in new urbanism, landscape urbanism, ecological urbanism, infrastructural urbanism is a focus on the environment that we haven't seen previously, a focus on systems, a focus on an integrated approach to ecological relationships, a focus on how we might think about flexibility and adaptability and local needs in ways that we haven't thought about previously. So I think urbanism is more, like I said, more flexible, more adaptable, more local, but also it is thinking about working across disciplines in a way that we weren't thinking about previously. So, you know, at, at WashU, we're really great at, I think, promoting interdisciplinary degrees. So we have dual degree programs where we have landscape architecture students, urban design students, and architecture students working together on the same projects. And I think what we see in infrastructural urbanism and landscape urbanism in particular are ways that those boundaries between, say, objects, green systems, blue systems, those boundaries begin to disappear. And we have to attack sort of the biggest problems of our era from all of our different design skills. So I, I think we're learning that. We're learning that, you know, and this was true really with the COVID pandemic too, that people are willing to create different kinds of community relationships than they have been in the past. You know, we had a, a forced immobility where people began to work at home and all of a sudden we wanted to be out in the street. We wanted to share public space. We wanted to build new kinds of community. So that's one of the benefits I think that new urbanism has brought. You know, how do we create places for people to occupy and share ideas and activities and spaces and, you know, foreground the sort of eight to 80. I think new urbanism is really trapped in the stylistic weight of the things they put forward originally in suburban nation and that have been built in places like seaside, mm -hmm. you know, and there's been even in places where it's not a greenfield development, there's so much emphasis on form based code. Mm. And the idea of form-based code is so unappealing to architects and designers, because even if it's loosely limiting, mm -hmm. you know, it has a lot of implications for limitations. And new urbanism does tend to support the idea that there's a stylistic preference. 
So what I tried to do when I'm talking about the rise of these branches, right, the new urbanism branch and the everyday urbanism branch, which I didn't talk about at all when you asked about it, and the landscape urbanism branch, is that there's benefits to each of these, right? The everyday urbanism, and you mentioned tactical, which is a descendant of everyday urbanism, they've been able to accomplish, you know, they were criticized at the beginning because they were like, oh, there's nothing permanent here. There's nothing about design. Yeah. But the reality is, like, you look at what Jeanette Sadik Khan has done in New York in Times Square, that's a tactical urbanism project that then became a permanent public space. And that model that I call top up urbanism, where you have bottom up ideas and top down agencies coming together to find overlap, like that has changed the landscape of cities. People are doing bike lanes and parklets, particularly during COVID, mm -hmm. where they're testing out ideas without having to go through all this red tape to see if they work and then they can assess them. You know, are they causing traffic problems or are they increasing revenue? You know, are they more enjoyable for people? And so everyday urbanism has had that positive impact. I think new urbanism has hugely impacted the conversation around walkability. I think one of the smartest things Jeff Speck did was to break off right and write his book on walkability and not say anything has to look like this this is urban environments and walkability is good for health and it's good for revenue and it's good for you know culture and community and it doesn't matter what the place necessarily looks like but we have all these benefits and then landscape urbanism you know is the only one that's talking about climate change and ecology and when you bring that in really important idea you know we have to talk about climate and ecology as part of our urban makeup so if you get kind of the best of all those and then you look at the condition we're in in our infrastructure where you have all of this obsolescence all of this failure all of this disaster all of this opportunity to rebuild and to respond to the damages that we've done in the past well then you have the best of all of these coming together and you have sort of a new direction for urbanism it's actually one of the things I'm most proud about in the book is that diagram that we did of what is infrastructural urbanism. Mm. I think it's I think it's one of the things that will be really useful for students because we, you know, we worked really hard on that. I mean, it basically shows landscape, architecture, architecture and urban design in the middle and who are the key players, what were the key events and how do those things all come together? The timeline that you put together? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That arrow and it's really interesting in the book, you know, there, you give a couple of examples of things I haven't thought about, or maybe I thought about on the on the periphery. I mean, the I-11 corridor, I mean, looking at all the different ways that you could rethink a highway corridor. You know, we had Billy Fleming on to talk about design with nature now a number of months ago. And thinking about wildlife corridors, thinking about, you know, connected spaces for, you know, a larger ecology. And this is something that I've really, I think I might actually even bore my newsletter subscribers because I pull out a lot of examples of like, the Dutch, you know, and their systems for dealing with water. Mm -hmm. There was a recent article in the Washington Post about Vienna and its 10,000 year flood system. You know, those are really important parts of urbanism, even if they're not necessarily discussed before. We're seeing with climate change that all of these systems are becoming one and we put them in these silos and then they should be not extracted, but actually combined even further. Yeah. And it's, you know, not to not to harp too much on the infrastructure bill, but it's I think one of the mistakes we're making when we're talking about infrastructure funding is it doesn't really make that much sense anymore to separate, say, energy funding and water funding, right? Because in the end, we really have an energy water nexus. We really have interdependence across our different systems. So we could do ourselves a great justice by beginning to talk about the interdependence of these systems and saying, well, you know, it takes energy to move water and it takes water to make energy. Let's talk about how these things can cooperate. Or it takes you know, th there's a relationship between permeable surfaces, tree canopy, heat island effect, and transportation. So let's get parks and rec people, and let's talk about transportation, and let's talk about walkability, and let's talk about energy at the same time. So I think thinking about systems as interdependent and interconnected systems is something we don't do enough. And, you know, you look at a bill that's going to line item different systems and segregate not only the sort of funding, but the people who work on those systems, right? They are siloed in their jobs. They're often not given opportunities to collaborate across their different agencies. So it's an important new way to think about what I call shifting the paradigm. You know, I think we're at a moment where we have to challenge the way things have been done because they've been done so long in a way that's sort of status quo.
And so there's an ecological part, but there's also kind of an economic and sociological part. I want to read something that stuck out to me on page 220, and I want to get your reaction to this. Okay. And it's after, I think, you discussed the work on the North-South Rail in St. Louis. The continued emphasis on economic development, real estate investment, and access to jobs through transit connectivity alone glosses over the structural fault lines in the city. The primary focus on economic development continues to promote an argument that growth is the answer, even in the face of continued discrimination, population loss, abysmal life expectancy, and spatial erasure. Yeah. So one of the arguments that I make repeatedly in the book and in most things that I write is that growth for the sake of growth is not the answer to our problems. And the idea is that we have to think about what I call measuring what matters, right? And measuring what matters is not just looking at that bottom line. And many of the arguments that have been made about North St. Louis are if we could just get investment here, if we could just get, and the example that's happening right now is the National Geospatial Agency, which is a massive federal agency that's moving into North St. Louis. And they have, again, gone through a process of eminent domain and property clearing and displacement, right? That is an economic win in the eyes of the city council and the mayor. But if you're measuring what matters, you're actually measuring the loss of community cohesion, the loss of long-term neighborhood investment, the loss of small businesses, the loss of informal relationships, the loss of a natural habitat, a series of, in, of integrated natural habitats. So part of that argument is how do we not just look at that economic number as a successful bottom line, but really take it apart and say, well, tax increment financing is benefit benefiting the business, but that tax money is going from somewhere else. Federal investment is benefiting the business, but that federal investment we could really use on that transit line. So siloing those funds too is detrimental to the social issues that we're trying to combat in a place like North St. Louis. So that's sort of the core belief that kind of underpins that idea that growth for the sake of growth isn't really the answer that everyone thinks it is, and that we've been relying on for decades. I think that's a really key point, especially in places like St. Louis or Cleveland or others that have seen continuous decline in population. But there's not a real way that they're going to see growth. And the growth that happens seems to be on the periphery or away from the places that maybe you know need a change of philosophy. And so it's frustrating to see that kind of discussion go, you know, because all these Sunbelt cities, they seem to be taking off and they seem to be growing. And it seems like the answer for their, you know, issues is, is this economic growth and never ending. But at the same time, you have all of these other places that are, I don't want to use the word stagnant. It seems like a negative connotation, but just they're not following in the footsteps of other cities in the Sunbelt or in the West or even in the East that are seem to be growing at a breakneck pace. And maybe that's a globalization thing. Maybe that's something related to, uh, I, I don't know, but it just seems very um, disconnected to talk about growth in a city that's not growing. We're pushing these low growth cities to think the same way as a high growth city. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that we're measuring them based on the same metrics. You know, you see that when every city wants to be called like the next innovation city, the next tech city, you know, and competing for the same populations to come do the same things. It's kind of strange. And there's some really great aspects to St. Louis and there's some great possibilities in those cities. I mean, Detroit has kind of capitalized on that, right? Detroit has been doing a lot of urban agriculture and so has St. Louis, a lot of urban agriculture, a lot of experimentation. It's just less expensive to buy property. It's less expensive to buy buildings. And so you have different kinds of experimentation happening in those cities and the, and the overhead is, is lower. And the potential for gain by creating new kinds of economies, like there's some really interesting things happening in St. Louis right now around trying to revitalize the original Black Wall Street. There's some new financial structures around greenlining, which is a kind of antidote to redlining. You know, how do we get loans in the hands of people who weren't necessarily enfranchised in traditional mortgage structures so they can stay in their homes. There's another thing that's interesting, kind of changing gears a little bit. When did we stop saying public works and when did we start saying infrastructure? In the 1980s. So, I mean, that was really when it went into popular culture. And that was part of this report that I mentioned, the Choate and Walters report that they presented to Congress. And it's pretty interesting. If you look at their original report, it has the word public works in the title. If you look at the one that was published and available sort of to a national audience, to anyone who wanted to purchase it, that second version has infrastructure in the title. 
So it's kind of a clear demarcation. And then when the results of that report were published in places like Time and Newsweek, they started calling it our infrastructure crisis. What do you think about that framing? What do you think about that switch from a more um, collective idea to a more technical one? I think it has deep roots, right? It has deep roots in our ideas about modernization, where we looked at the city as a set of efficient systems. So, you know, you mentioned NACTO versus ASHTO a second ago, and the idea that, you know, ASHTO is based all on maximum efficiency and safety, right? So a turning radius has to be this and a shoulder has to be this. And that's so we can get as much throughput as possible, highest level of service. Which is debatable on the safety aspect. <laughs> right. Very debatable. Right. That, yes. I was repeating their, you know, their, right. mind, their ideas about it. And I understood now, what you were saying. <laughs> yeah. And now we're really, we're really looking at options through organizations like NACTO, which is sort of an amazing effort to bring an alternative to ASHTO. We're looking at ways where we can serve trips, where we can serve people, where we can serve, you know, getting things done, where we can serve relationships. And I think the move towards the term infrastructure is it's tactical and strategic and about efficiency. And we were in a period, you know, where we were trying to upgrade our performance level, you know, how much can we get out of the systems that we're creating, you know, and this is part of, like I said, modernization, but then it was also sort of part of our ideas about neoliberal economics. So public works, I think we lost this idea that our shared systems are part of our public space that they are, if you look at the original WPA, right, the production of public works at that point was about building morale and building this idea of a sort of collective built environment that we could celebrate. So it was about also creating culture. In that case, it wasn't just about, you know, even water and electricity and ability. It was really about the arts and design and fashion and our national park. So it incorporated all kinds of things that were sort of creating a, a bigger public identity. And now we're kind of in between, you know, now we want the best of both worlds. And I think we've heavily swung the pendulum towards the tactical. Thinking about public works specifically, the Sixth Street Bridge in, in Los Angeles, that was a piece of public works. And then now it's something different. Can you discuss a little bit what, how that changed and, and what the new project kind of maybe displays is possible? So when you say the original, you mean the original, original, the like 1930s version. Yeah, like the bridge. <laughs> the original bridge, yeah. So the new project, and I'm really a fan of the new project, the original Sixth Street Bridge, the one from the 30s, you know, that had to be torn down because it was not really, unfortunately, salvageable, has been replaced by this Sixth Street Viaduct project. And the new project is also, it's multimodal multifunctional and it has been designed with a kind of an engineer and architecture firm collaborating equally so that already sort of sets it apart from your average kind of bridge construction it was also the team was selected through a design competition so there was the opportunity from the very beginning to think about this project as something more than a sort of bridge connector so the the project and it's amazing it's under construction now so I'm pretty excited to be here in Los Angeles and be able to like bike by it every once in a while and see how it's going. It is a project that is set up for pedestrian bike and car traffic to go over it, but it also is really enhancing public space underneath it. So it has garden space, it has courts for recreation, it has bathroom facilities. It was designed with a good amount of input from the neighbors on both sides. So it connects East LA with West LA. So the East LA neighborhood that it's serving has a low area of public space per capita. The Western LA portion of it is more affluent. So it's sort of distributing public space and park space to both sides of the river. There are also plans in that project that anticipate future change in mobility, like a Metro stop that wasn't, you know, may, may happen, may not happen, but it allows for that potential. So it, it is a sort of proto next gen infrastructure project. So that gets kind of to my next question, which is what is infrastructural urbanism? Or what are the basic tenets of it? How is it different maybe from other urbanisms, but maybe similar as well? Infrastructural urbanism, I sort of see it, and I go through this in the book as, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, you know, it's one of the responses to the kind of postmodern urbanism and pessimism that happened in the late 80s and 90s, but still a strategy to think about how we can 
respond to the biggest challenges we have now in terms of social equity, wealth disparity, and the challenges of climate change through using next generation infrastructure strategies and particular thinking about systems-based urban design. So it is accomplished through a series of what I call next generation infrastructure criteria. And there were originally seven that came from the analysis of the WPA 2.0 competition. And then there were 11, and now there are a total of 12. And the ideas of me testing infrastructural urbanism through my research and through my coursework are saying, how do we take these 12 next generation criteria and use them as a way to transform the prototype so that we're looking at a systems-based urban design philosophy where we are all part of the same sort of ecology. So humans, animals, natural systems, a human made and natural systems. And we're thinking about measuring what matters, like we discussed earlier, not just growth for the sake of growth or dollars as a bottom line. We're also thinking about broadening the process so that we're incorporating a variety of disciplines and residents into the conversation around how we think about urbanism. And we're projecting this sort of optimistic, better future where people have agency in creating a future world that supports a higher quality of life. So it is interdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary. It is cross-agency. It is productive. So we're looking at performance, how cities might perform in environmental and social metrics. And we're looking at creating environments that are local, flexible, and adaptable. I was looking at the criteria. It reminded me of the Scout Law. Have you heard the Scout Law before? <laughs> no, I haven't. What is the Scout Law? A scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. And that's just from rote memory of being a Boy Scout. But the criteria themselves are an infrastructure is multifunctional, public, visible, socially productive, locally specific, sensitive to eco-economy, driven by design, symbiotic, technologically smart, developed collaboratively, and operational at micro and macro scales. I did quibble a little bit with the technology one. I think we don't always need the newest technology. When I was reading through that, I felt like there was a meme the other day. I think it showed like this huge carbon scrubber that cost like $15 million and they're doing something in Iceland. And then they had a picture of a bicycle. It's like, you can either drive a car and operate the scrubber or you can ride a bicycle. <laughs> well, one, let me say that I hope one day these are as well known as the scout mantra. <laughs> that would be really exciting. If and people could just rattle it off. If people could just rattle it off. They're just walking down the street and they're evaluating their city based on that. And two, I would agree with you. I feel like technologically smart isn't necessarily the same as the latest tech. Mm -hmm. I still feel like it's sort of the most underdeveloped because it's not necessarily my area of expertise. But where, so when, when you look back at the projects that are in the book, and we've done, we've gone back and we've done this analysis of the WPA 2.0 finalists and winners. And so I think a really interesting example of that is Nicholas de Monchot's project Local Code. So the technology he's using is kind of how do you take an algorithm for underutilized spaces, get technology in the hands of nearby residents so that they can provide input as to what they want that space to be used for, and then use that information as a way to create a space that supports neighborhood needs. So that's not necessarily the most high tech, but it's a way to sort of integrate the technologies we have to make a space that is smart. So I would say it's a little bit different than just let's use technology to solve our problems. There was something else in the I-11 project, I think, which was one of the two projects you focused on in the book really intensely, was the difference between the infrastructure symbiosis and the infrastructure adjacency and thinking about kind of how all these things come together. And, I, you know, we mentioned this before. and We talked about the ecology of everything, the thinking about things not as separate pieces or in silos, but together as a whole. But I'm wondering if you could just kind of expound upon that idea even more, because I think it's really important to kind of drill down into why that's important. Yeah, yeah. So one of the concepts is how we turn infrastructure from a monofunctional system to a multifunctional system. So the very basic way that people often think of, the easiest way is infrastructural system adjacency. So you might see places, and it's surprising, but Texas has sort of been thinking about this, right? Putting 
rail and road, which isn't so uncommon to have, you know, we have that in Los Angeles, rail and road connected, but also say energy generation, water delivery conduits and Wi-Fi, right? Fiber. So when you put them all next to each other, they are adjacent, but they are not symbiotic, right? They're not using the resources collectively in any way. When you start to think about infrastructure symbiotically, you're actually taking the waste of one system and using it as the fuel for another. So one of the new cases that I discovered is Kallenborg symbiosis, which is a commercial symbiotic set of industries related to each other. And they actively said, okay, we're seven. Originally, they were six or seven different industries. And they got together and they said, how can we collectively figure out ways to use the products that we're already making, the waste from the products that we're already making as fuel for other products, in the meantime, potentially generate new kinds of product development and new kinds of savings. So it's a sort of closed loop way to both reduce waste and increase productivity by creating relationships across different systems. And until we start to break down the silos between different industries, as well as different infrastructural systems, you can't even begin to start to imagine those symbiotic relationships. Yeah. I said this earlier, but I think it was really well kind of discussed in that I-11 corridor project and thinking about all the ways that those things can be connected. In that specific industrial district, that was really interesting to see how they were taking all the pieces and putting them together in that you're not kind of taking it and exporting things to everywhere else. You're just kind of circulating internally. What's the biggest takeaway from from writing this book? I mean, obviously, you have a new system of criteria. You have a whole idea about urbanism from the infrastructure urbanism. I'm kind of wondering, you know, you've been working on this book, like you said, for over a decade. What have you taken away from it that's kind of been a positive, you know, action going forward? When I started to plan my sabbatical, so I'm on sabbatical now for this academic year, I was finishing up the book. So I was revisiting kind of the conclusions for each of the case studies, the I-11 Super Corridor and the Northside Southside Metrolink. I was revisiting all of the WPA 2.0 finalists and winners and talking to them about what they were doing. And I think one of the biggest takeaways is that things have changed, that these projects, project types are moving forward and that they're more well received in governmental circles than they were 10 years ago. When I started this project, there were so few examples that I could find as models for things that were built. And they had significant issues. I mean, the High Line is such an obvious example for an infrastructure reuse project. And we look now at the degree of gentrification that's happened around the High Line. So we can look at it for many positive benefits. You know, it really did kickstart a kind of idea about what we could do with obsolete infrastructure, but it is less applicable to infrastructure that we want to continue to perform its original duties, but in a better way, or for infrastructure that we want to build now that can do multiple things. So one of the things is, is that there's more models. There's more people who are open to these models and there's more models happening. There's also a radical shift in the design fields. So the rise of landscape urbanism and landscape infrastructure and now infrastructural urbanism. I have colleagues who understand that this is part of architecture, that understand that this is things that designers should be doing, that we should be engaged in the conversation around infrastructure. And 10 years ago, like I said, you know, when I started thinking about doing a PhD in this topic, it was not part of the architectural conversation. So that's been a big change as well. Designers are talking about infrastructure and, and they weren't before. And you mentioned Billy Fleming. I think Billy is also you know, critical in a really good way about what our job is. You know, What is our job moving forward to be design activists in this space, in this landscape of what we need to accomplish for the next step of um, you know, responding on a bigger scale to the challenges we have facing us. And then I would say maybe a third thing is the number 12, which is the added criteria, which sort of comes up at the very, very end, which is the idea of reparations, right? So that the social question around infrastructure, that those of us who have been thinking about it for a long time, things like redlining and urban renewal, which was just about you know clearing neighborhoods, 
and dividing neighborhoods, that those questions now are on the table. I mean, that's one of the most optimistic things about this infrastructure bill is that there's conversation about reinvesting and connecting neighborhoods that were divided in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. That is an awareness of the discrepancies of infrastructural investment and how it has unevenly benefited and impacted neighborhoods of different types and communities of different types around the country. Yeah, a couple of days ago, the Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg, mentioned, you know, the, he brought up Robert Caro, right? He <laughs> mentioned Jones Beach and the infamous lowering of the bridges. And oh, it, Robert and Moses. Robert Moses. And, well, Robert Caro wrote the book, but yes, right. Robert Moses. Right. Totally. But, you know, it was interesting, not because he said it necessarily, but it was that he mentioned it and then it started this larger conversation. And now you can, you know, you can debate about whether you know, Ted Cruz or whoever else that responded to that with their nonsense was part of a conversation, but it actually did. It, it it brought it out to make the discussion actually out in the open rather than kind of under the table. So I think that was a really interesting thing that happened. And when you start discussing these things and bringing them out in the open, I think it, it generates more, more discussion and then hopefully brings more people in to think about it more critically and, you know, have a, have a positive outcome in the future. Yeah, we can't fix it if we're not even talking about it. We don't exactly we don't admit that it happened, that it's real. Also, you mentioned the High Line. You know, it's, the interesting part to me about that, and and maybe even a lot of you know TOD projects and things that have happened in the past, is one of the things that's interesting is for me, anyways. We build these projects, light rail lines, streetcars, etc. And one of the things that happens is they get generate a lot of activity. They generate a lot of kind of economic you know impacts, but there's only one part of the city that gets this, you know, kind of investment. And it's interesting, like the High Line, it's such a, a, a kind of a, an interesting project. If it was more places, do you think that it would have the same impact? Like if, if we had these types of amazing projects that transformed communities all over in every community, do you think it would still have the same impact as if it was just that one project that everybody continues to want to go and be by and, and organize around? It's interesting. Okay, so I thought you were going to go, I thought you were going to say <laughs> something specific about the High Line as a single conduit. And I was going to talk about the reason, one of the reasons why Los Angeles has developed the way it is. And it's, you know, the idea that a single line only, well, has maximum benefit around that line, right? Whereas a grid gives benefit in a distributed way, which is how LA ended up being a car centric city rather than a sort of transit centric city was this idea that we want to, you know, for property developers to distribute sort of the value. But you're really talking about like one city compared to another city. Many cities are trying, you know, I think there are a lot of cities that are trying to invest in things like the High Line. I mean, if you look at the Beltline in Atlanta, right, the redevelopment in Atlanta, I think it's a different version of the High Line. I, I think what the High Line brings is a proof of concept, right? That's one of the things that's important about the High Line because it is a very New York specific kind of high design version of this proof of concept. But before the High Line, when you didn't have that proof of concept, and I would even say, you know, with a little bit of hesitation before the big dig, because the big dig had tremendous amount of problems, right? Tremendous amount of cost overruns, safety issues, you know, how many decades too long did it go? But it also was a version of a proof of concept. We can do this nearly impossible thing and we can remove this piece of infrastructure and replace it with something that, that serves the community in a different way. The High Line does it in a way that is focused more on thinking about the architectural, landscape architectural, urban design implications of what space means and how infrastructure can be a component of public space. So as a proof of concept, I think it's really important. And if that are appropriate to that city and appropriate to the way residents are willing to use that place, I don't think that's going to be a bad thing. Yeah. Well, where can folks find the book if they want to check it out? They can find it at Rutledge. They can search for it, Infrastructural Optimism, Linda C. Samuels. They can also go through Bookshop and find it at their local bookstore. And last resort, they can help send Jeff Bezos back to space and get it through. <laughs> we, we go with bookshop.org first. <laughs> I would vote for that too. <laughs> we'll go with bookshop.org first. Well, Linda, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate your time. I really enjoyed speaking with you. Thanks for having me. 
And thanks for joining us. The Talking Kidways podcast is a project of the Overhead Wire and posted first at Streets Blog USA. Thanks to our wonderful Patreon supporters for sponsoring this show and Mondays at the Overhead Wire. You can support the show by going to patreon.com slash the Overhead Wire. You can sign up for our 15-year-old newsletter at theoverheadwire.com. And you can listen to the show on your podcatcher of choice, including Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, and Apple Podcasts. And if you can't find it there, you can always find it at its original home at usa.streetsblog.org. We'll see you next time at Talking Headways.